Buenas tardes. Hello. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Boa tarde. I am Andrea Coronato. I'm researcher of Cadiz Conicet out of Ushuaia in Argentina. I am also uh, the one of the IAG vice presidents and uh, the Latin American co-opter of IAG. IAG is the international um, association of geomorphologists, as, as you may know. Uh, together with my colleague from Universidad Federal de Bahia in Brazil, Grace Alves, uh, we are in charge to coordinate this fourth IAG webinar to celebrate the 2024 International uh, Week of Geomorphology for this part of the world, for our Central and South American territories. Um, uh, this is an official uh, activity of IAG, so the presentations and some lectures um, must be in English. But anyway, we also use Spanish and Portuguese, our, our local languages, for some lectures, for questions, for comments. So please feel free to participate in any of the three languages. All of them are accept, accept, accepted. Eh, buenas tardes a todos, ahora en español por las dudas. Soy Andrea Coronato, soy investigadora de CONICET en el CADIC, en Ushuaia, y vice, uno de los vicepresidentes de la Asociación Internacional de Geomorfólogos, más conocida como IAG o IAG, y además soy representante para Latinoamérica de esta asociación. Y hoy, con, junto con Grace Alves, mi compañera de la Universidad Federal de Salvador de Bahía, y secretaria de la Unión de Geomorfología de Brasil, eh, estamos encargadas de organizar y de llevar adelante este cuarto webinar para celebrar la Semana Internacional de la Geomorfología del año 2024. Esta es la cuarta oportunidad en que nos reunimos en esta primera semana de marzo para eh, realizar esa, esta actividad. Les decía que como es una actividad oficial de IAG, el idioma oficial es el inglés, por eso empezamos, eh, abrimos eh, la reunión eh, hablando en inglés. Pero de todos modos podemos hablar en español, en portugués, y les pedimos a todos que por favor se sientan eh, libres de hacer preguntas, comentarios, en cualquiera de los tres idiomas, porque todos eh, son aceptados. Grace. Wow. Boa tarde a todas e todos, eu sou a Grace Alves, sou professora na Universidade Federal da Bahia, sou secretária da União é, de Amorfologia Brasileira e estou aqui junto com a Andrea, pesquisa, Andrea Coronato, pesquisadora do CADIC Conicet em Ushuaia, é, Argentina, também vice-presidente e representante da América Latina no IAG. Uh, nós estamos encarregadas de dar boa, boas-vindas a todos e todas que estão aqui assistindo o quarto webinar para celebrar a Semana Internacional de Geomorfologia. É, por esta ser uma atividade do IAG, né, da Associação Internacional de Geomorfologia, nós utilizaremos o inglês é, em algumas apresentações. Também vamos comentar e perguntar é, e discutir em espanhol e português, é, que são as nossas línguas locais. Então, por favor, se sintam à vontade de fazer perguntas em português, em espanhol, em inglês, aqui for mais conveniente, é, que nós iremos repassar para os jovens é, profissionais em geomorfologia que estão apresentando hoje, é, para que a gente tenha aí uma rica tarde. Six young geomorfologists from Costa Rica, Brazil, Chile and Argentina. Some of them living abroad or working abroad are the protagonists of this webinar in which they will share their results coming from postdoctoral studies or coming from their participation in research projects. Um, we want to deeply thanks to all of them. Uh, seis geomorfólogos de Costa Rica, de Brasil, de Chile y de Argentina son los protagonistas del webinar de 2024 y ellos van a compartir con nosotros los resultados de sus estudios doctorales, postdoctorales 
o de resultados de los proyectos de investigación en los que están eh, o estuvieron involucrados. Eh, queremos eh, agradecer profundamente, we want to deeply thanks to Raquel Granados Aguilar from Costa Rica, but living in the United States, uh, Joao Paulo Soares de Cortés and Renata Jordan Enriquez de Brasil, a Ignacio Ibarra Cofré de Chile, aunque viviendo en el Reino Unido y trabajando en Reino Unido, y también a Mariana Correas González y a Damián Grouch, ambos eh, de Argentina. A todos les agradecemos ser parte de esta actividad. We are, we are very thankful to all of them to accept to be part of this activity. Eh, tenemos entonces profesionales en geomorfología eh, dos países Costa Rica, Brasil, Chile y Argentina alguns destes vivendo e trabalhando fora da América Latina, que vão compartilhar com a gente os resultados de suas pesquisas. É, gostaríamos de agradecer, então, a Raquel Granados Aguilar, da Costa Rica, João Paulo Soares de Cortez e Renata Jordan Henriques, do Brasil, Ignácio Barra Cofre, do Chile, Mariana Correas Gonzalez e Damian Grock, da Argentina, por terem aceitado esse convite para fazer a apresentação de seus trabalhos hoje aqui. Muito obrigada. We hope the dissemination of the results of their work will motivate to other young researchers, students and professionals to discover the remaining questions about landforms and processes of the Earth's surface and their interaction with the atmosphere, lithosphere and biosphere as well as with the society and its infrastructure. Also, we hope to reach the IAG intention to promote this type of meetings, useful to know each other and to strengthen geomorphology in our continent. Esperamos que la difusión de los trabajos de nuestros disertantes sea una fuerte motivación para otros jóvenes estudiantes, investigadores, jóvenes profesionales, para descubrir los interrogantes que aún se nos presentan cuando estudiamos o cuando nos plantamos frente a geoformas y procesos que modelan o que han modelado la superficie de nuestro planeta. Cuando nos interrogamos acerca de sus interacciones con la atmósfera, con la litósfera, con la biosfera y con la sociedad que sobre ellos habita y sobre la que implanta su infraestructura. Asimismo, también es intención de la IAG que estos encuentros sirvan para reunirnos anualmente, para conocernos, para fortalecer el desarrollo de nuestra disciplina en nuestro continente americano. É, esperamos que a divulgação dos resultados dessas pesquisas possam servir como motivação para jovens pesquisadoras e pesquisadores, estudantes e profissionais para buscar as questões associadas às geoformas e aos processos que têm modelado a superfície de nosso planeta, assim como suas interações com a atmosfera, a litosfera, a biosfera, com a sociedade e o espaço produzido. Assim, esperamos que essa proposta do IAG possa acontecer anualmente para que possamos conhecer e fortalecer o desenvolvimento da geomorfologia em nosso continente. Ok, no more words, it's time to start with the, our first presentation. ¿no? Ya es momento de presentar a nuestra primera disertante. Sem Ella... mais a gente passa então para as apresentações, por favor, André. So we uh, have time to receive our next uh, uh, presenter and the last one of this four webinar for the 2024 uh, Geomorphology Week. He is Ignacio Ibarra Cofre. Welcome, Ignacio. Thank Bienvenido, you very much. Ignacio. Hello. Muchas gracias. Hello. Hola, hola. <laughs> Let me introduce you. Uh, he is a geographer from the University of Chile. And uh, also he got his uh, magister in the physical geography in geomorphology in the University of Sussex. Yes, and uh, he has the PhD in physical geography, also in geomorphology in Durham University, both in the um, United Kingdom. Is that right? Yes. 
<laughs> so now he is also assistant professor at the geography department of the University of Chile. But you are working and living in in uh, Scotland or Ireland, sorry, in Ireland. No. No, very much more closer to you in Santiago de Chile. Ah, you are you <laughs> come back. Ah, yeah, good. not so far away now. <laughs> it's just oh, some okay, okay, kilometers good. to your location. Yes, well, yeah, you okay. come back to to join the position here in oh, Chile. Oh, yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, well, he will um, um, present his study about temporal analysis of four D rock fall activity and cliff erosion from automated hourly resolution laser scanning, monitoring, and the potential applications in Chile. O, o sea, el análisis temporal de la actividad de caídas de roca y de erosión en acantilados en 4D, en sistema 4D, a través del monitoreo láser, escáner, automatizado, con resolución horaria, y sus potenciales aplicaciones en Chile. So, we listen to you. Go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. Very glad to be here and, 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 and be with all of you guys. So this is a very nice moment. Um, uh, so I will uh, share uh, the slides now. OK, so well, thank you very much to everyone and for your patience. <laughs> so uh, well, my presentation is about for the rockfall activity and cliff erosion, also involving topics about laser scanner monitoring at high resolution. Um, uh, this is part of my PhD thesis result that um, we are in the process of publishing. Um, this work by, was supervised by Professor Nick Rosser and Matt Brain of Durham University. And we are now presenting today the, or some results of our thesis uh, of the thesis and some potential applications in Chile. So um, the rationale for research was associated with challenges in the data collection and processing in terms of, for example, the frequencies of the data collection, because most monitoring campaign, um, monitoring rock slope involves uh, monthly, monthly monitoring, monthly surveys or, or weekly surveys. So the, inter the intervals of data collection are longer than the duration of the geomorphic changes of the slope, which is, are very important. Second, the limited duration of monitoring campaigns. For example, the, um, these um, usually the published uh, literature uh, involves uh, two or three years of monitoring, but only uh, using, again, monthly surveys or up to 10 months of, of uh, monitoring, but uh, using one hour frequency. So usually this constrained understanding of the long term, but continuous erosional dynamic occurring uh, across the slope surfaces. And third, limitation related to the lack of replicability of published methods. So this is important because that hindered the uh, or constrain the efficient processing of large scanner data sets. So uh, these limitations generate gaps of knowledge in terms of, for example, the understanding of the timing and nature of the rockfall activity and erosion, but at, at both high and near continuous temporal resolution, the geomorphic hazard that rock flow poses, and importantly, the risk mitigation, and uh, the possibility to establish and understand links with other geomorphic processes, such as rockfall trigger, triggers like um, precipitation, free uh, moisture, temperature, etc. So uh, to try to contribute to fill these gaps, uh, the objectives of my research were to develop a method for the automatic 4D detection and volumetric quantification of rockfall activity, which allowed me to basically obtain a tool to process a large, very large data set of laser scan of point clouds and generate then a um, inventory of rockfalls in for, in three, uh, for the inventory of rockfalls. However, the focus here was on optimizing the speed of data processing because of the size of the data set, as you will see. And from this objective, the second objective was to examine the timing and controls on the rockfall activity during three years of clip monitoring and at one hour data acquisition between 2017 and 2019. 
So uh, this, uh, with the aim to assess, for instance, how the erosive work done by small, medium, or large uh, rockfalls accumulate uh, accumulate into a long-term erosional signature. So uh, this is the study site. It's located in the UK, in Whitby, North Yorkshire. Uh, this is a coastal cliff. As you can see, the monitored cliff section uh, was 60 meter in height and 200 meter length. Uh, the lithology uh, is mainly bedded sandstone and sandstones. Um, these are discontinuity control uh, rockfalls. Um, the area of monitoring is this uh, one highlighted within the within these red uh, touches. Uh, the area of monitoring, as you can see, is very was very large, more than five thousand five hundred uh, me square meters. And in particular, as we were interested in the mechanisms or controls of, on rockfalls, we were interested in the brittle rock outcrop, which is this area of the slope phase. So this means that we clip the topsoil, um, the debris, as you can see here, forming the talus and the base of the cliff, this part because of the low point spacing. So this is the area of research that we present today. Um, this is a map of the study area. Uh, this is the A to A profile, which uh, show uh, from the Zenith point of view, the cliff section that we are monitoring. This is the um, East Pier of Whitby. Um, and this red point indicates the location of the laser scanner and a thermal camera, which were installed inside a lighthouse. As you can see here, uh, the system uh, for monitoring was uh, installed at the top of the lantern room of the lighthouse. This is the laser scanner that we use. Um, we build uh, um, a special glass to allow the, the laser beam to penetrate and monitor the cliff face. Um, we did also the structure to protect the instrument outside and inside. And importantly, this figure D shows all the engineering and computational setup uh, to allow the laser scanner to work uh, continuously. So um, the, the, this will about this research also involve a lot of engineering geomorphology problems to solve. Um, it, it's important to know that the power the, uh, the laser scanner was provided with constant power supply using cables from the Whitby Harbor. So uh, this allows us to scan the cliff face always from the a fixed position, a constant position, and at a very high rate of point cloud acquisition. Again, one hour. So we always monitor the same cliff, cliff section um, every one hour taking, uh, taking data. So in terms of the methodology, um, it is, as you can, uh, it is very long and complex, but I will just show some a couple of slides because the aim or the focus of the presentation is uh, or on the results of our research. But to obtain the 4D rockfall inventory, I did develop a method uh, that was designed to handle 3D point cloud or scan files with X, Y, and Z local coordinates, such as below. So this, this is a typical high resolution point cloud that we obtained from the previous uh, slide that showed the um, field deployment. The method or workflow that I did develop was a computational routine, which is defined by a sequence of code that are called upon and applied directly through Cloud Compare, which is a software of robotics, informatics, etc. Trigger, trigger on a rolling basis using the command line of Windows. And now we have updated uh, this system using Python. The workflow includes three principal stages of automatization, which I call principal script, alongside with satellite scripts for minute but needed automatization tasks, minimizing the need of manual manipulation of the data set. Uh, this is a conceptual figure that shows the data retention pipeline during the application of this workflow. Um, during 36 months of, con of monitoring, we collected over 2,000 scans, which represent 100% of the data set, initially collected data set, but we can see but how by applying quality control steps, important quality control steps over the data set, uh, we start to lose uh, data to in order to work with the best possible uh, um, scan files. So uh, for instance, I did develop, which is I call the partial scan filter, which is a filter that was designed to automatically detect when the laser scanner was working on the bad weathering condition, what weather conditions such as rainfall and fog. Then a similar filter, the, the, the high density scan, where we also, also 
uh, is another quality control step, etc. And high root mean square error registration um, of the data, um, which couldn't be uh, resolved. So we also lose some percentage. So by the end of the monitoring of the workflow, the stage three of rockfall volume estimation. For this stage, we work with a total of 14,700 and over M3DC2 scan pairs or chain detection files, which represents 73 percentage of the initially collected data set. Uh, this number is important because this number is the total number of output data used to build the Rockfall inventory that we will be presenting today. So uh, with this data set, basically, we undertook pairwise comparison of 3D point cloud or chain detection, which was conducting between uh, sequential hours, which means that from the first day of monitoring, we start to compare the point cloud of 0, 01 a.m. versus 0, 02 a.m., then 0, 02 a.m. versus 0, 03 a.m., 0, 03, 0, 04, and so on during three years of monitoring. So as you can see, it was impossible to manage this uh, data set manually. Um, I, 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 and so for that reason, I did develop a, a lot of coding to, to solve these problems. Um, yes. So in this stage, at the end of this stage, uh, we apply this formula given by Williams et al. 2018, where n is the number of pixels that were detected as surface erosion. Um, D, D is the depth of change or erosion in the slope cell, and AC is, AC is the pixel area. So basically the volume estimation are calculated uh, uh, by the multiplication between the area and the depth of change. And also we the, the, I did develop other formulas to also estimate the volumetric error of the measurements. So in terms of the result, uh, we will structure this in three uh, main parts. First, the view of the cliff face and key characteristics of the rock for the rockfall inventory, then the magnitude frequency distribution and negative, negative power loss scaling of the rockfalls, and finally, the time series analysis and the erosional signatures observed. Um, in terms of the result, this is a spatial distribution of the rockfall activity per year of analysis. The, the data um, was um, clustered by month of monitoring. Um, just for an easier examination of the emergent uh, patterns. And in this figure, the figure D, we can see the annual rockfall overlaps, which is the sum, the spatial sum of all the other uh, rockfalls. Um, um, over uh, 8,300 uh, um, rockfalls uh, were, upset, were detected from more than 20, 6,000 hours of monitoring. This, therefore, this is probably uh, the, the longest um, high resolution rockfall inventory produced for, produced for the UK and most probably for the world, because we consider here also, we detect all, also very, very small spalling of rock masses. Um, so the smallest rockfall volume uh, that we uh, obtained was 0 0.025 cubic meters. The average rockfall was 0 0.02 cubic meters. Uh, the largest rockfall was about 22 cubic meters. And the total eroded volume was almost 200 cubic meters um, uh, by the end of the monetary period, which um, yield an annual cliff phase annual retreat of 0 .0, around 0 0.03 meters. As you can see here, um, rockfalls uh, occurs across the entire cliff phase. They show uh, uh, different morphometry from elongated, vertically elongated shapes to very compacted shapes. They mm, usually tend to tend to occur across the bedded sandstones, but mm, large rockfalls cross all the type of beds, regardless of the type of lithology, and so on. In terms of the magnitude frequency distribution and negative power law scaling, this plot are indicators basically of the relative set distribution of the rockfall events. These are also use, useful in landslide literature or interpreted to analyze the rate of material loss or, or the level of erosion. In the y-axis, we have got the frequency density of the event, uh, the, the frequency of the event using a logarithmic scale. And in this, in this x-axis, we have the corresponding rockfall volumes. So uh, the slope of the modeled relationship, this one shows the proportional contribution of lower to higher 
uh, to larger rockfall survey. So three distinctive patterns we can see from this result. First, the, the, that the mid-range size of the rockfall uh, fit well the negative power law. Uh, these are located between the upper and the lower erosional threshold that we observed. Um, the beta exponent of the negative power law uh, for the entire monitoring period is this value and is characterized by a value of minus 1.8. Um, which is an overall indicator of the uh, indicator, numerical indicator of the erosion. Uh, between 2017, as you can see, the beta exponent were very similar, uh, but in 2018, the, the level of erosion was uh, only a bit uh, lower uh, when comparing to the other years. Um, this exponent are very um, agree in general with published literature that use this metric magnitude frequency distributions uh, to characterize landslides and rockfalls across the North Yorkshire coast or also across the world using inventories of landslides. Uh, and it is important also to say that this um, exponent uh, demonstrate a level of cell of organization criticality of uh, the of the system of the land landform behavior, uh, uh, which agree with uh, this type of literature about cell organization criticality in geomorphology. Um, second, we see a roll up region of rockfall activity, a market region of roll up activity, which is character characterized by a, a deviation of the power law from uh, uh, the upper threshold of erosion, which uh, here we can see a, a high, um, um, a high um, frequency data, but uh, with low, very low rockfall volumes. We interpret it, therefore, that these represent very small spalling of rock masses that were controlled by uh, heavy rock weathering and um, fractured rock masses. Um, also, we detect a heavy, a heavy tail region of rockfall activity. This one characterized by a lower frequency densities, but larger volumes, and usually from 6.5 cubic meters um, until 22.5 cubic meters, uh, which we interpret as the control geomorphic control uh, given by energetic uh, heavy or uh, input energy over the system, like storms. Importantly, thanks to the 4D high frequency data processing, we see for the first time here a rockfall that otherwise would have been severely underrepresented, providing a data, data set that, that has not been seen before. Uh, it is this type of metrics are all, um, also very important uh, for rockfall hazard hazard. But how do the rockfall accumulate into a long term erosional signature as time series? Uh, these are some of our results. Um, in the upper plot, we see the total rainfall that um, occur, uh, that was used, using five-day beams. Uh, uh, in a similar way, we group uh, all the total rockfall volume, these ones, using five-day windows for an easier examination, examination of the pattern, because actually this time series is much, much longer. So it is, it is much more difficult to see patterns if we don't group the data set. So um, in this figure, we see the total rockfall volume, which is represented by, represented by this red part. And this other y-axis represent the cumulative, the corresponding cumulative rockfall volume, which is the cumulative zoom of these individual volumes. Uh, here uh, we see uh, using blue bars, uh, that cross the entire, uh, all the graphics, uh, those uh, rockfalls uh, that were coincident with the same day precipitation or up to one or two days of antecedent uh, precipitation. And with, with the numbers one to 23, we highlight the main erosional episode, which were coincident with this, with again, same day rainfall or up to one or two days of uh, precedent precipitation. So um, in this in, in this other plot, we can see again the same total rockfall volume, the same bar, but uh, here. And in this other y-axis, we see the maximum rockfall volume and event, the single the single lar largest rockfall volume event detected within these each five day windows. So we see overall a high fluctuation of the total volumes uh, across the time. We observed the total of 23 main erosional episodes in which the main rockfall event was higher than one cubic meter, generated abrupt increases in the total volume loss, these ones that we interpreted as erosional jumps in time. 
because this, uh, this um, generates sudden changes in the or abrupt changes in the co in, in the curve of the cumulative volume loss. We also can see that larger erosional episodes occurring either in winter, spring, and summer, especially after summer storm, which uh, suggests that there is no, in this morphoclimatic setting, there is no uh, particular seasonal control over the erosion because um, uh, largest cliff collapses or rock falls occur not only in winter, but also in summer uh, during the warmer months. Um, so it is also, these results also hold key implications in the context of the climate change and global warming and how these uh, slopes uh, respond to these inputs of energy. This erosional jumps importantly contain the beginning or the end of a total of nine main periods of gradual erosion, period one to uh, nine, uh, using Roman letters. You can see these ones here. Um, we can also see that larger rockfall supply a constant proportion of the total volume loss in each erosional episode between 46 to 95 percentage of the total volume loss detected in each five-day window. Um, in this graphic, we can see uh, these red arcs um, with dashed lines, which are used to highlight uh, the, the period of time that took place between the end of one erosional episode, for instance, this one, until the beginning of the next one here. So uh, we can see here that the two highest erosional episodes, for instance, three and 18, these ones, tend to be followed by the longest period of gradual erosion for an eight, as you can see, involving between 250 and 260 days of gradual erosion, that the lower magnitude episode, for, in for instance, number one, 11 and 14, tended to be followed by shorter periods of gradual erosion, the period two, um, five, and seven, this one, involving between 120 and 140 days of continuous gradual erosion. So this is about half of the time of the period of time that follows the highest erosional episode, as you can see, which means that after large magnitude event, a return to a steady baseline rockfall activity occurs, which we interpret as a level of pocket and erosion occurring across the cliff face and this landform whose duration tend to scale with the magnitude of the preceding erosional episode or geomorphic event, which are these ones. It is important to note here that this result also indicate that it is take, takes time to accumulate rock damage uh, to be efficient to, cloud, to cause large cliff collapses again. And now our ongoing research is focusing on the mechanisms that generate, what are these underlying mechanisms that explain these patterns that we can see uh, only at high resolution and using a very large data set. Um, this figure shows the estimation of the return uh, recurrence intervals or return period um, We uh, using the maximum volumetric rockfall event that we observe there per month. These were estimated using the generalizing stream value distribution use, using the maximum probability estimator. So we can see, for example, that uh, using three years of observation, uh, rockfall volumes of one cubic meter can have a return period of one to four months with 100% of excellence probability. But however, the return period for the largest rockfall forming the erosional episode three and 18 is almost two years, as you can see here, that the, for, for the largest rockfall of the episode one and 11, the return period was almost one year. So the bigger the magnitude of the rockfall, the largest the period between events of comparable magnitude will be. So this suggests that uh, the period of apparent post failure quite sentient to scale in average, uh, in average, not always, with the preceding detected rockfall volume. This was uh, this type of relationship are very well known in the field of floodings in fluvial geomorphology, in some uh, fields of earthquakes, but this was not seen before in, using, uh, in the literature of rockfall using a very, very robust data set, large data set. So something is happening through they drive this emergent relationship, which is part of our ongoing research too. So some key summaries and implications, we can highlight the development of a new computational routine that allows the automatic detection and quantification of rockfall at constant one hour data collection resolution. Over 8,300 rockfall were observed, uh, waiting a total volume loss of almost 200 cubic meters and 0 0.03 meters of cliff retreat within, in this period at early resolution. 
Magnitude frequency and distribution of rockfall demonstrating, demonstrating key new features such as uh, regions of roll up and heavy tail rockfall activity. Otherwise, that would have been mostly underrepresented. That the long term erosional signature is controlled by infrequent large rockfall, the driving erosion jumps in time that punctuate period of steady baseline erosional activity in this landform. That period of post failure quiescence tend to scale in duration with the preceding volumetric magnitude, magnitude or geomorphic event, if you want to see this like that. And that there is an apparent relationship between the rockfall magnitude and the length of the period of time that follows larger rockfalls, holding these for so key implications for the understanding of the processes that drive this type of the behavior and how we assess the hazard that rock slope poses and how we can mitigate these hazards. Some potential applications in Chile, our ongoing research uh, will focus on the high resolution 3D monitoring or, or coastal cliff, because we have got here unknown rates of activity and the hazard that this pose. We are already proposing some working on this. Objective with Nick and Matt, we also are working in the slow monitoring um, in the arid environments, uh, such, such as the Takama Desert and the Andean Rock Slope in high altitudes to better constrain environmental triggers and the hazard assessment, especially in, in, in highway corridors that we have got here. And importantly, to choose the best strategies for slope monitoring. This implies the equipment, the method, the study design, and always resolve new technical challenge and mathematical challenges that arise with this type of uh, big data application, automatization, and coding to get this type of result. So this is my presentation, and muchas gracias por su atención, y sorry for the inconveniences at the beginning of the presentation. <laughs> muchas gracias, Ignacio. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much. It's a very interesting presentation. It's amazing the amount of data you collected during these years. And uh, it's very nice to see you had the possibility to to use new, new technology and high tech technology for analyze the that magnitude of, of data. Okay, any any one have any question to to Ignacio? No, nothing in the chat. No, nothing. I, 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 I'm, I was wondering if um, these results are used for for planning there in, in the, in the locality you work, or it was just uh, the application of a new methodology just for scientific purposes. No, it was just for scientific purposes, but in particular, this project was funded by a mining industry because this is one of the of the area of the North England, or the, uh, the, one of the few remaining across this country. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were they needed this to put funding in this, this type of scientific research for the um, mitigation of the, to inspect the mitigation of the environmental impact, for instance, if there was yeah. subsidence in the cost cliff here. So this data is, Use it for to probe to inform these industries what is going on basically. Um, so they provide this uh, the, the the money basically where it comes from. Okay, thank you. And uh, another another doubt that I had you you related uh, the the origin of the rock falls by to storms so to precipitation mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, has the the waves or the the high tides uh, impact on the base of the cliff any consequence in rock falls or it's secondary yes, it and you didn't take into account yeah very nice I, question. I saw Thank that you, very you much. have a very a very good accumulation area and perhaps that uh, protect the the vertical part of the cliff but I have the the lab, even though. Yes. Uh, well, this cliff um, is should be one of the most monitored cliffs across the world. There are also one in New Zealand from the Zurich Geological Group, um, and we. So there are some previous research uh, colleagues that work it here, but using lower uh, temporal resolution or longer, long, uh, sh shorter, sorry, monitoring periods of time. But all these previous group of uh, uh, PhD students show that there is fewer uh, correlations uh, between this, the tides and the rock falls. And okay. even the previous uh, observation here made in this area made by Agar in the 60s, 
they demonstrate how the cliff profile, I don't have here a figure of the cliff profile, which is very interesting geomorphologically, but it's concave here and convex here. So yeah. this uh, in theory demonstrate that the subaerial processes dominate over the marine processes to control the erosion yeah. in this setting. So we know already, even, and it was then more control when this rock armor was built. So we know that most of the erosion, efficient erosion, is controlled by the subaerial processes, which are our interests here, because we have, there are a lot of papers already published in this area that show very low correlations between the rock force in general and the tide impact and the storminess. So this is a very nice thing to, so for that reason, we already know that it's, the precipitation is one, but not all the mean geomorphic controls in this yeah, section of you. the slope particularly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Ignacio. Thank you very much. Okay, so this is, uh, this was our last presentation. So we reach the end of our activity, at the end of this webinar 29-24 to celebrate the International Geomorphology Week. Uh, we are very deeply thanks to all the lecturers. We have uh, traveled from uh, North America and the Rocky and in the Andes and also in mountains close to the Andes in Northern Patagonia and also uh, we went to the Atlantic, to the Amazonian area. We knew about the mass wasting, uh, fluvial processes, sea level rise, and uh, permafrost also. So I think we, we could um, know about new research, uh, the advances of the several topics and different areas of our continent, even though in other continents also. And uh, while well, Grace and me are very thanks to um, the lecturers to be here and also very thanks to the people who are interested and participate all along the, the, the afternoon, stay with us and some comments and questions. And um, well, I, I hope uh, you can or you, you um, can uh, celebrate this geomorphology week in your places perhaps with other kind of activities or disseminating our sciences, our, our work. And um, IID want to encourage, encourage all of you to continue working in geomorphology, in physical geography, and continue trying to understand uh, um, the relationships about the land surface and uh, atmosphere, lithosphere, and human uh, actions. So we, we want to be close of you and we, we invite you to visit frequently the, the web page of the IAG, which is uh, three times wgeomorphs.org org, and to be noticed there about the activities, about the training program of the IAG, which uh, can help you to take part of uh, several seminars, symposiums, or even though several congress in different parts of the world. And um, think that this association is a nonprofit association and just um, integrated by people who wants to uh, deep uh, our discipline all over the world. And uh, well, uh, I, I want to see you next in next activities or sometimes perhaps in the future um, symposium of the Asociación Chilena de Geomorfología, which will be here next, or perhaps uh, uh, in Argentina in the National Congress of Geology, where there will be uh, the Quaternary Symposia and also the symposium of the IAG Working Group of Geomorphology of the Andes. You can um, find the, this uh, this um, information in the in, in internet or communicate with us. And I'm sure also Grace uh, could uh, invite you to other uh, activities to be done there in in Brazil. This is all by myself by my my part. Uh, I want to thank you again for be here and see. I want to see you in the next future. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Bye bye. Grace. Uh, just uh, some information too about the presentations, the today presentations. I will be uh, in the next week, probably, or in this month. <laughs> Uh, the presentations will be available in the UGB YouTube channel. Uh, so we, in the, probably in, in, the, in this month. Yeah. Okay. So, thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you soon.